what we do in the virtualization space at Red Hat. Uh, we started with uh, operation system level virtualization solutions uh, a while ago and uh, first we started with Zen and we were shipping Zen as our own virtualization solution in row 5. Uh, at some point we realized that there is a better solution on the market and with uh, the acquisition of Kumbranet uh, we switched to KVM. And now we do lots of cool stuff in uh, KVM world. We support it for different architectures. We support it for data center and cloud uh, solutions for many customers. And we truly believe that it's the best technology out there and moreover it's open source. At the same time, we truly believe in a hybrid world which is around us. And uh, our customers want to run RHEL in all sorts of environments which are out there. And of course they run RHEL on RHEL and they run it on KVM, they run on OpenStack and RHEL. At the same time they run RHEL instances on public, private clouds and all sorts of different virtualization solutions which are out there. Namely uh, they run them on AWS and at the same time of course they want to run them on Microsoft solutions. And Azure is the second biggest cloud provider in the world nowadays and uh, of course they want to run there and as you might probably heard we had a big uh, partnership uh, announcement uh, at the end of last year and uh, now we officially support RHEL in, on Azure. We were supporting RHEL on Hyper-V before but now we officially support it even on Azure. So what is Microsoft Hyper-V? Uh, Microsoft Hyper-V is Microsoft's virtualization solution and uh, it was first introduced in Windows 2008. Uh, it's the core of their Azure cloud. The Azure cloud uh, is, as I said, the second uh, biggest cloud in the world and it actually runs Hyper-V. So um, Hyper-V is a type 1 uh, hypervisor, which means that it runs on better hardware. And uh, unle uh, un it's not like KVM when you have uh, a model and you run uh, something inside your uh, operating system as a process. With uh, type 1 hypervisors, you run hypervisor on bare hardware and then you run your management operating system just as a guest for this hypervisor. In uh, Hyper-V they are called partitions. And this first guest is called root partition. It's uh, similar to uh, DOM0 in Zen. Uh, Hyper-V requires hardware virtualization, but all modern x86 processors support that. And uh, currently it's able to emulate two different platforms. First is so-called Generation 1 VM. And it is a legacy platform with BIOS and all sorts of emulated devices, including I.O. And you can actually run an operating system which doesn't know anything about Hyper-V there. It's going to be not super fast, but you can run it. At the same time, since uh, Windows 2012, uh, it supports so-called Generation 2 VM. Generation 2 VM is an UEFI system, and it doesn't have uh, emulated devices. So to run something there, this something should be aware of the fact that it is running on top of Hyper-V. It should support uh, Hyper-V specific devices. So, um, yes, yeah. how it's done. So Hyper-V emulates uh, x86 system. And uh, uh, it, as it emulates a standard platform, at the same time it provides us with some so-called enlightened uh, passes and special uh, paravirtual services. Uh, as I said, for uh, input-output you have uh, uh, emulated passes for generation 1 and you don't have them for generation 2. So these uh, enlightened uh, I.O. passes are mandatory for uh, generation 2 VM. Um, it also has uh, a set of uh, paravirtual uh, services such as like heartbeat so your host is aware of the fact that your guest is still running. 
Uh, it has utility drivers, and I'll tell more about them later. Uh, it has uh, special services for uh, timekeeping and synchronization. And uh, guests are able to report crashes to the host. So, um, Hyper-V and Linux. So, um, of course, our Microsoft was interested in running not only Windows in Hyper-V. So they started developing uh, their drivers for Linux and at the same time they released Hyper-V at 2008. And uh, in 2009, these drivers were added to staging. At that time, it was mostly done by Novel. Uh, in 2011, these drivers left staging and now they are part of a uh, normal uh, Linux driver set. Uh, these drivers are present by default in all currently present uh, Linux distributions on the market. And they're completely open source and uh, GPL licensed, so there are no legal issues with them. And uh, as you can see, uh, like currently on Azure, 25% of all VMs run Linux. Uh, I got this data from Microsoft, so we should trust them. It should be true. Uh, yeah. So uh, as you can see that Linux is important for them, so it's not a tiny portion of their business. So who develops them? Uh, of course, uh, this effort is mainly li li driven by Microsoft themselves because they're interested in uh, Linux working as a good guest on Hyper-V. At the same time, as you can see, uh, community involvement in the development process is growing. And last year, only half of all commits came from Microsoft. The other half came from community. And namely, like one third of all commits in Hyper-V space came from Red Hat. So we are doing something there. Uh, so, uh, which drivers do we have in kernel? We have uh, first two is storage driver and network drivers. And these two are crucially important for performance. They're performance critical passes because that's actually what you do with your VMs. You use your some storages and you use some networking and you want it to be fast. Other drivers are not that performance critical, but they also exist. Uh, this is mainly our like, frame buffer device. So uh, you can draw something on your screen. Uh, you have keyboard. And actually, uh, the funny thing is that in uh, generation 2 VM, this driver is mandatory. Unless you have it, you won't be able to type anything in your VM. So don't forget to put it in your RAM drive if you want to debug something. Um, it has uh, emulated mouse. It has a uh, ballooning and memory hot plug driver, which is very specific to Hyper-V, and I will tell you about this particular driver later. And it also has utility drivers. So about storage driver. Uh, as I said, it's really crucial for high performance. It supports all types of storages with a single drive, uh, single driver. So uh, you can connect both SCSI, IDE, or fiber channel uh, devices uh, to Linux through this driver. You don't need different drivers for that. Uh, it's SPC3 compliant since Windows 2016, which is not yet released, uh, but we expect it to be released later this year. Before that, it wasn't claiming uh, this compliance, but it was implementing uh, SPC3 features, such as block discard. Uh, this driver supports multi-queue because it's a high-performance driver, actually. NetVSC driver. So uh, again, crucial for high performance. Supports multi-queue and scaling on both transmit and receive paths with, uh, uh, on the receive path, they call it like virtual receive side scaling. And it actually means that 
you first uh, determine some conditions when it needs to start scaling uh, incoming packets. And it starts pushing these packets to different queues on your guest. Uh, and for, for the transmit path, uh, they call it vi virtual multi-queue, which is also uh, host-driven. So it can be dynamic or static. With static multi-queue, you just get a number of queues up front, and you can use all of them to send your packets. With a dynamic multi-queue, a host waits till your guest really needs to scale. And at that point, it actually measures your CPU load and network load. And at some point, it sends you a signal that you need to use more queues. And your driver starts scaling in Linux. Um, as it's a network driver for Windows, we need to decorate each packet with RNDs header, which is very similar to some wireless cards which were out there a while back and which had only Windows support. And uh, for someone who is familiar with uh, network stack in a Linux kernel, there is no NAPI support for the driver. So we can't uh, implement, uh, we can, but we still didn't implement the active pooling mode. And I hope that it's gonna be implemented earlier or later. So, now, Microsoft encouraged me to show you these performance numbers. <laughs> so, again, data from them. We should trust them. They're on the dark side. They have cookies. So, uh, here you can see performance data for the NetVSC driver on a single Hyper-V host. Measurements were done on uh, a single NUMA node uh, 8 CPU system. And uh, uh, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, this uh, data is uh, from the transmit path. So they were measuring it with like iperf style test. And as you can see, Microsoft claims that on some connections, like less than 1,000 connections, uh, Linux driver, like on 64 and 256, Linux driver performs better than Windows on Hyper-V. So for some connection numbers, the situation is slightly different, but still, uh, the difference is not really big. So we are on par with Windows drivers for Hyper-V. For Azure, for Azure, we are, for some reason, performing slightly worse. But again, uh, the difference is not that, oh, yeah, and I forgot to tell you that uh, 40 gigabyte, uh, net, uh, gigabit per second network adapter was used for the test, and we did like 31 something gigabits per second for the guest, which is pretty okay. Uh, it's, these numbers are from these uh, PV drivers, so no, net, no device pass-through was used there. So it's not SRIV, it's pure PV pass. On Azure, for some reason, slightly worse, but maybe it depends on like, how Azure hosts are optimized. And in this particular instance type, uh, they had two NUMA nodes and 32 vCPUs total. And we did well. So, uh, I already uh, pronounced utility drivers several times, and what are these uh, utility drivers about? So, we have a number of drivers which are not uh, visible for a user, and these are uh, mainly like clock sources and clock events, because for uh, virtual machines, uh, it's better to use uh, paravirtual passes for these devices. We have time synchronization, so when our guest starts, it receives uh, time uh, from its host and it can adjust its own time accordingly. It also receives this uh, synchronization when we migrate guests. So we, when we migrate it to the other host, we can get a uh, time counter from the host. We have heartbeat, as I told you. We also have uh, special to Hyper-V devices. 
uh, and uh, which are paired with user space daemons. And uh, all the source code is in Linux kernel, including these daemons in tool subdirectory. Uh, we have three utility drivers. First one is key value pair. And actually, it's just a simple key value server. So you can, from the host side, you can store some value on your guest, and you can retrieve the value. But uh, it wouldn't be that uh, interesting uh, unless it was uh, used for network settings. And using this key value pair daemon, you can actually get your network settings from your guests. And you can set network settings to your guests, like adjust their DNS server. Um, we have second daemon, which is called VSS. And it actually comes from uh, like virtual shadow storage, or what was uh, the name for it from Windows. We don't have such things in Linux, <coughs> but we need it to do consistent backups. So when you backup your guest and you do it live, you want to make your data consistent. And to do that, uh, you need to freeze your file systems before you do start doing the backup and actually get the snapshot. Uh, because uh, when you run on Windows, your storage can be snapshotted. So uh, Windows does the snapshot for you, and you can like saw them and uh, continue using them. For this purpose, we have a special driver and a special daemon in Linux. There is also a uh, file copy daemon, which can be used to copy files to guests without network involvement. Everything happens through this host guest protocol, which I will describe you later. Memory balloon. Uh, so, uh, as I told you, uh, this uh, ballooning mechanism is specific to Hyper-V. So, what we have, uh, you can, uh, you may, as a customer, you may want to uh, assign more memory to your guests on your host than you actually have. Uh, you do this under an assumption that uh, not all memory is going to be used at once. So. Uh, guests will scale and they will adjust their memory needs accordingly. And for that purpose, uh, we report our memory pressure, like how much memory is used in the guest every, like, second. Yeah. And uh, we just send these reports every second to the host. And the host, Hyper-V host, can decide whether we need to balloon up or balloon down. Balloon up means that we are giving away some memory. We are actually allocating some memory pages, which we are not going to use. And we report their frame numbers to the host. Once host receives these frame numbers, it can actually detach physical pages from these frame numbers and assign them to some other uh, guest. And at that point, we cannot use these pages. Once we try to access these pages, we get uh, general protection fault. So uh, at some point, we may want to get our memory back. There is no direct uh, way to get this memory back. We can just report higher memory pressure to the host. And we expect our host to return us our memory. Host comes to us with uh, these frames and gives us back. At that time, in Linux, we can freeze these pages and start using them as normal memory. The same driver is being used for memory hot plug. Before Windows 2016, uh, it was uh, only possible with so-called dynamic memory, which was a bit slow. What's the like, real implementation of the dynamic memory, we don't really know. We never saw Hyper-V sources. But um, since Windows 2016, you can basically uh, add memory to your guests anytime. And this will arrive. We have uh, some weird issues with that in Linux, that uh, in Linux, our memory hot plug granularity for x86 is 128 max. And in Windows, it's 2 max. So there is a special handling in our driver for that. Timekeeping. Uh, as I told you that um, in virtual machines, we'd rather use PV passes to get time. So what do we have? We can still use TSC, just like our DTSC instruction. But uh, 
in Hyper-V specification, it's said that it's not stable. So you can get like huge jumps in TC value. It can actually jump back. So um, it's not a good time uh, source. So there are two additional time sources. First is so-called hyper load source, which is really simple, but it's slow. There is a special MSR from which you can read uh, this time. Why is it slow? Because every time you read from this MSR, it actually means you're exiting to the hypervisor. Hypervisor traps you, hypervisor puts some value for you, and you get back. Good, but slow. There is a different clock source which is called TSC page. And it's actually a shared memory page between you as a guest and the hypervisor. And uh, there is a special protocol how to get time value from this page. You just read some sequence number, then you read something on the page, then you do your some calculations, and then you check the sequence number to see that it hasn't changed since you access it for the first time, because if it changed, it means that you need to read from the beginning, otherwise your host was updating time at the same time. It's super fast because there is no exit to the hypervisor. You're just reading from memory. We have uh, a bunch of uh, Hyper-V drivers in development. It's like, again, the effort is mostly driven by Microsoft. Uh, there are three drivers I am aware of. First is a uh, Hyper-V socket, and it's actually uh, similar to what we have for VMware, um, which is named VSOC, and uh, it is a way for two applications on your host and on the guest or on two different guests to communicate to each other without real network. So they will communicate through this host guest protocol, which is named VMBus in uh, Hyper-V. Uh, the second driver is PCI pass-through, which is designed for some obvious purposes to pass through a PCI device to your guest. There is no PCI pass-through at this time. And the last one is RDMA for a very specific, like for one Mellanox card, they are able to do uh, this RDMA in the guest. And they have a special so-called front-end driver for this Mellanox card, which is in your host. Uh, so you can like do direct RDMA from your guest. Uh, I expect they'll be uh, uh, upstreaming this driver later this year. It's actually open source now. You can see its sources on GitHub, but uh, they never put it to kernel, so we at Red Hat don't support it now. We are waiting for them to start upstreaming it to Linux kernel. So I promised deep dive when I submitted this talk, so now start the deep dive. So uh, how all these drivers work? First, why do we need these drivers? Why can't we use emulated devices for everything? Well, uh, emulated devices would emulate hardware protocols. And these hardware protocols were never designed uh, to be used by like host guest communications. So there is no way we can make them super fast. All other virtualization solutions out there have similar uh, PV drivers, like KVM has Virt.io, then has this front-end, back-end pairs, and there are PV devices for VMware. Uh, some devices we have, they just don't have hardware counterparts. So there, is, there is nothing to emulate, like uh, this memory ballooning uh, device. As I told you, that there is nothing nothing similar in hardware which can balloon your memory. And we have this enlightened drivers, Microsoft name, enlightened. Uh, they're from the other side of the port. Yeah. Uh, so uh, these drivers are implementing so-called VMBus protocol. And VMBus is actually a set of things which uh, you're supposed to implement to interact with your host. And uh, uh, it's based on the concept of channels. Uh, uh, channel is like a single entity for communication. Uh, they're bound to particular VCPUs, 
and uh, you can have one or more channels for each devices. Uh, uh, we have a way to transmit data and ring buffers are being used for that but as we are using like ring buffers we'll also have to uh, have a way of signaling both ways so our host should be able to somehow signal the guest that something is going on and our guest is some, should be somehow able to signal uh, the host that there is something needs handling from the host side. So how do we signal something to our host when we are in the guest? The concept is called hypercalls and it's super simple. You allocate a sim simple memory page and you create like a virtual mapping for it and then you put its, the physical address to some MSR for the host. Then you treat it as a function. So I have some functions there. So once you want, want to perform hypercall, you put something like uh, uh, input, output, and like hypercall ID to your register, and you just call the, the page, thinking that, oh, there is a function there. Hypervisor uh, traps you there, performs the function you asked for, and returns back. And you can look at your output, like usually you put some address there, and hypervis hypervisor will uh, write something there. How does host signal something? Uh, there are two concepts in Hyper-V. They're called messages and events. Messages are, are being used for non-performance critical communications and uh, they uh, usually mean that something is going on with the channel, like we want to open a new channel, we want to close a channel, uh, we want to like, restart the whole communication, unload everything. And uh, it's actually like uh, a single page per vCPU where there is actual data. When you receive an interrupt, like physical interrupt from your host, you're supposed to look at the page and if there is some data there, you get a message from the hypervisor. But this message is limited to 200 something bytes and uh, as you understand, you can make any performance critical communication based on messages because you'll be just delivering one message per call and you'll need to have an interrupt for each of them. So it's gonna be that slow. We have events. Event is a different page per CPU. <coughs> and when we receive this interrupt from the host, it's actually the same interrupt which signals messages. We're supposed to check this page and this page has an indication which channels have data to process. There is like an index there, so it's kind of fast. We don't scan the whole page to see all the bits. And we get all the channels which require processing. We go to these channels and we process data. Where is the data? The data is in ring buffer. So ring buffers, very simple concept, uh, where you have some memory space. Actually, there is nothing like circle data structure in your memory, so you use some amount of memory and then it like wraps around. So you have like two positions, like reader position, writer position, and the data between them is unprocessed data. So writer writes, reader reads. Nobody blocks the counterpart. So uh, for each Hyper-V channel, you have two rings, two ring buffers one for sending data and one and the other one for receiving data. And these rings can be really different in size. So as you can see like for the network driver we use like 128 pages, for uh, storage driver we have 256 pages, uh, for some non-performance critical devices we use uh, much smaller rings. So we need to somehow signal that there is data. So on the receive ring this is not symmetrical. So uh, on the receive ring, we receive this physical hardware interrupt when there is data. So uh, we check this event page, figure out like which channel it has, go there, and we are supposed to read all the data which is on the channel. Because uh, if we have like more than one packet there, 
we won't receive new interrupts for the remain. So we need to read them all. So at the same time, like if the whole ring was filled with data, we need to signal the host back. OK, we processed the data. There is some space there. You can continue. On the transmit ring, where we put some data for the host, uh, we have two guarantees from the host. That first, once the host starts reading from this, this ring, it will read all data which is on the ring. Second guarantee is that it will uh, indicate that the reading is ongoing. So with these two guarantees, uh, we can only signal our host uh, because like, we signal with hypercall. Hypercalls are expensive. So we are trying to make as less hypercalls as possible. So uh, we only signal when, when our ring trans, uh, to, uh, like, uh, goes from uh, empty state to non-empty state. In all other cases, we either already signaled the host and it will process the data, or the host is actually reading the data, so we don't need to signal. That was it, actually. Uh, you probably have some questions for me. Please. Um, you mentioned that between the current recording, um, many are expensive this because uh, uh, some months ago we had the issue while rebooting a Linux system within Hyper-V, it simply crashed while rebooting and uh, had a lot of fun with uh, the TSS uh, until we were able to figure out something. Yes, <laughs> so uh, there are special MSRs which Hyper-V emulates where the guest is able to report that it actually crashed. Uh, and uh, there is not that much data where, which you can put there, but you can put there like your instruction pointer and some set of your registers, CPU registers. Why is it useful? It's useful because if you have a huge cluster of Hyper-V hosts and you have crashes, you want to uh, be able to identify fast uh, if you have identical crashes or different crashes. And you can do that uh, just from like looking at this instruction pointer. If they're all crashing at the same instruction pointer, that this is probably a same, the same crash all over the cluster. And you can see these events in Windows event log. So once you write to this MSR, you actually do the protocol is like that. You put like your instruction pointer uh, a x b x c x d x and sorry and uh, then uh, you write to this control MSR which means report the event to the Windows host. Nothing happens to your guest after that, so you can actually report several crashes. It won't like kill your guest or something like that. But uh, then looking at your Windows event logs, you can see that your guest actually crashed. That it's this specific uh, 18,590 event. And it tells you where your guest crashed. So you can just take your like, Linux uh, kernel image, do adder to, uh, to a line, and you will see where your kernel crashed. Even if you didn't get like K dump or uh, you have no console output, like nothing. Just out of this data, you can get something sometimes. Sometimes not. Sometimes it's just some random instruction pointer and there is nothing like that in your kernel. Uh, it is an existent feature. Yeah, the question was, sorry, the question was uh, if this feature exists or in development, it is an existent feature in Hyper-V uh, and it is an existent feature in uh, Linux kernel since last year. I think like the beginning of last year it was implemented upstream. Uh, actually, there is uh, no control for them. So you either start them or not. There are two parts uh, in Linux. First is kernel driver. Second is this user space part. And they, they communicate through character device nowadays. So uh, it actually does what it's designed to do. Network uh, driver, it calls uh, scripts. So you can actually alter them. Like set IP address, and it is a script. 
You can put whatever you want there or just like. Follow up. What happens if the hypervisor wants to use those things and the user space is not running? And is it the same between like Azure and standalone hypervisor? Uh, in Azure, yeah, uh, you are not able to access the host, so I'm not sure what's going to happen, but there are probably some like management engine around that. On Hyper-V, you'll just get uh, an error. Like, you can uh, use PowerShell, and with the PowerShell, there is a comment like, assign this IP to this VM. If the daemon is not running your Linux guest, you will just get an error, like, or a timeout, if, like, there is no module, nothing. More questions? Please. We don't actually need to because uh, everything is going to happen on Windows side. If our volume <laughs> is on Windows, and it mm -hmm. actually is, that uh, Windows can do real VSS snapshots for like the whole file system with the volume. Okay. So the only thing we actually need from Linux is to make it consistent. Mm -hmm. So we do freeze for all file systems, do the snapshot, and then we saw them. So uh, it actually takes like second or two. So your guest is not blocked for like minutes when you do the backup. Okay, okay. And the uh, second question, uh, maybe it's a stupid one. Uh, uh, have you some comparison between, for example, KVM running uh, Linux as well and Hyper-V? If uh, in the matter of stability, of uh, speed and so on? Uh, I think like uh, there are way too many comparisons like that. So for different workloads, you'll get like different results. And uh, it's not like, oh, this particular solution is better. At Red Hat, we are like trying to do our best to make all these workloads work as best as, as good as possible. Like, so we are not like slowing down one workload just to make the other look better. Like, <laughs> we could. <laughs> More questions? Thank you.